excited to be presenting on the topic everyone's been waiting for is diving further into nutrition and diabetes. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of myths out there about you can't eat carbs or can't eat this. And we're going to tell you all about everything you can eat today. <laughs> so we have um, Bella and Haley here today from our nutrition degree program. And I'll let them both, um, both introduce themselves. And feel free to post in the chat any questions you have as we move along or through our participation um, through some of the learning we're going to do today. Or feel free to turn on your microphones, whatever you prefer. And I'm going to now turn it over to Bella and Haley. Right. Thank you, Trisha, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Tatum, too. I'm just going to give me one quick second so that we can share our screen with you guys so you can connect it. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. Oh, I can present. Oh, sorry. Uh, present. Right, it's gonna load, and then do you want to present the talk? All right. So this is the big nutrition session for the diabetes self-management workshop. So I'm Haley. Um, I know Bella's done one mm -hmm. of these before, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so this is my first session with you guys. I'm a dietetic technology student at PBCC. I've been fingers crossed to graduate in May. I actually got a degree right out of high school in 2010, but kind of changed up my career and came back. I have two little boys. Um, in my free time, I like to hike, and I also teach a group fitness class. My dream job is at Wits, and I chose dietetics because, um, honestly, after losing a lot of weight, I kind of wanted to help more people do that, but I quickly learned that that's not what dietetics is all about. There's a lot more um, opportunities and possibilities with dietetics. Yay. All right, I'm Bella, and I was in the first installment of this series with Teresa, so some of you guys might recognize me, but those of you who don't know me, so I'm Bella McDaniel, also at PV studying in the Diet Technician program, and then this summer I plan on transferring to ASU, where I'm projected to graduate about the end of 2022, so next year with my undergrad. And then I also, I have a three-year-old outside of the crazy world of school and work. And speaking of work, I have multiple jobs. So I work at Honor Health as a diet rep right now to kind of just get my foot in the door. So essentially, I take orders on the phone and making sure it fits in with like their diet that they're prescribed and make sure they get all their macronutrients. Like, and I also help at the end of the tray line checking off those tickets. So it's a lot of good opportunities there. And I also work at Tailored Bites, and which is a nutrition concierge, so it's owned by a registered dietitian, and she does meal plans and meal preps for those people. And then likewise, why I'm passionate about dietetics. I just think it's really cool how like food can do so much to our body. I mean, we all know that, but it could like really help you in so many ways, but it could also harm you if not taken to a certain extent. And then like Haley, I would also love to work for WIC. I love community nutrition and just kind of giving back. And something about WIC, it's very empowering, helping children and other women like myself in certain situations and just making sure that they get the help that they deserve. So without further ado, we're gonna just jump into the presentation. All right, well, we're gonna review what we talked about in the previous session. So if you weren't here, here's a little recap. So in the first session that me and Teresa did, it was an overview of monitoring of diabetes and an introduction to that, as well as like the science behind glucose levels, glucose monitoring and other resources we provided. And then session two in which Trisha and Teresa also did, they talked about hypo and hyperglycemia they introduced a little bit of nutrition as well and had nutrition management. Or right. yes. So for today, we're gonna really dive deeper into um, nutrition and dietetics in regards to diabetes and how those macronutrients affect our blood sugars. We're gonna talk a lot about carb counting and carb choices and how we can make wiser choices for more health promoting um, balance in regards to diabetes as well. Alrighty, so I'm going to talk about the fun topic of carbs when it comes to diabetes. So what do carbohydrates do to my blood sugar? 
Well, first, they're necessary. I know it could be a big myth, like I talked about in the first session, how we don't need them, or it might be a big fad to restrict um, carbs to a very low amount, but our body does need them. We need it for our brain, for our bodies to function. And they also have the greatest and fastest effect on our blood sugar, as we talked about as well. So we don't wanna avoid carbs like mentioned, but we also wanna keep them moderate so we don't wanna go overboard. And we're gonna dive more into what that means as well. And pretty much I know people talk about like good or bad carbs, but any carb can raise your blood sugar, but there is a difference in regards to the density of that carbohydrate. All right, so the amount and source are important when it comes to carbs. So balance, moderation, and variety. So for example, say you get a serving of fruit and a half a cookie and they may have the same amount of carbs and equal sugar content, but the fiber in the fruit will have a less effect on the glucose, as well as the fact that that fruit has more vitamins and minerals versus where a cookie may be a little more processed and the type of sugar will spike your blood sugar a little faster. But you can still have that cookie. It's about moderation and key but just also selectively choosing what kind of carbs you're putting into your body versus what. And also the fruit's more filling as well. All right, so we're going to talk about our portion sizes. And this is kind of like a fun way and more of a tangible way to kind of get a grasp of portion sizes. So it's called the hand tool. So as you can see, you have your hand. So for your palm size, it's in regards to like the amount of meat. So about three ounces of meat. So it would be like the size of your palm and then the size of your fist is about a cup or 30 grams of food. So like ice cream or cooked cereal. And then your thumb is about a tablespoon. So like dressings and mayo. And then the tip of your thumb is about a teaspoon as well. So we don't always have the resources to like weigh out our food or have a measuring cup while we're out and about. So kind of just using your hand is more of like a physical way to kind of measure, especially if you're on the go or on the fly. So that's definitely like a fun traditional way to, you know, kind of manage your portion sizes. All right, and then this is also a nice visual way to do it. This is called the My Plate. So a lot of you guys might um, recognize this, some of you guys may not. It used to be like the old school pyramid, but they changed it to a plate. So it's more of a visual when you're looking at your plate of food. So I really like this because it kind of helps to visualize, okay, this is about how much fruit I should have in my plate in ratio to the other macronutrients. So as you can tell, you know, dairy is like a little portion off to the side, and then you have, you know, protein and grains, and then your vegetables take up a larger portion as well as your fruits as well. So I love to refer to my plate, and which is a great source. So we're going to dive in and talk about a carb choice. So a carb choice is a legitimate term. So a carb choice refers to one carbohydrate choice equals 15 grams of carbs. So we're gonna really talk more about that. But for example, if someone says um, half a cookie is one carb choice, that means half a cookie is equal to 15 grams of carbs. So in general, and this can definitely change depending if you're on any medication or you know if you have any physical or different ailments, but women need about 45 to 60 grams of carbs. So, and we're gonna talk about that math later, which is about three to four carb choices. So at each three meals and 50 grams of char, um, carbs, one choice for snacks is needed. And we're gonna talk about that math too. So it'll all make a little more sense. And then men often need about 60 to 75 grams of carbs. Like I mentioned, that could vary from how physical a person is or any other ailments that they may have. So 60 to 75 grams equals about four to five carb choices because each one equals 15. But like I said, we're going to dive into that. So it all makes a lot more sense and flows more. All right. And then we're going to talk about carb exchange. So this is when we're going to dive a little deeper into how our carb choice and exchange works. So here we have a little chart that I got from Lily's Diabetes from the American Diabetes Association. So each food group has about, um, has like a certain amount of carbs per serving. So like, for example, a starch, like a sweet potato, half a cup of sweet potatoes equal to one serving. And then in one serving of sweet potato is 15 grams of carbs. So 15 grams of carbs equals 
um, one carb choice, that would mean that also that half a cup of sweet potato equals one carb. So, and usually a serving of fruit equals 15, milk usually equals to 12. These are all in regards to one serving. So like a one serving of non-starchy vegetables equals five carbs. And then we're gonna provide this resource to you guys as well. So based off of this list, how many grams of carbs of one serving a melon have? So a melon's a fruit. So if a melon's a fruit, how many grams of carbs would that have per serving? If anyone wants to um, chime in or in the chat as well and answer that, that'd be great. So I know it was kind of confusing. So melon, it's a fruit. So that means one serving of melon would have 15 grams of carbohydrates. All right. And then free foods in regards, in regards to the carb exchange. So free foods are foods that have zero calorie or in, insignificant and have little or no impact on your blood glucose levels, such as like a lot of your diet foods. So diet sodas, sugar-free jellos that are made with, you know, sugar substitutes, salsa made with tomatoes, you know, very low in sugar and has a low caloric index broth, and then tea and coffee. So usually these don't have any effect or very little effect to your glucose levels because of the very low sugar and caloric content. All right, so carb counting. So what is carb counting? It's a technique used to calculate carb choices based on the serving size and label. And if you really want to like get into and participate, I'd really recommend having like a piece of paper and a pen close by. If not, you could always watch and you could rewatch this when it's posted later to kind of get the gist of how to do it because it does take some practice, but kind of overview, we're going to overview this. So like we talked about, so one carb choice equals 15 grams of carbs. So the formula would be the number of grams of total carbs divided by 15 and and 15 is the grams of carbs um, in a carb choice equals the amount of carb choices. And like I said, it took me a while to get it, so it'll definitely take some practice, but just some little math and formulas go around. So we're gonna practice. So let's say one serving of saltines is 16 crackers, and then 16 crackers equals 22 carbs because it's one serving. So we're gonna use the formula up here. So the number of grams of total carbs in that serving. And like we said, there's 22 carbs. And then we're going to divide that by 15. So the amount of carb choices that a serving of saltines is equal to is one and a half. So one serving of saltines equals to one and a half carb choices. So, so far, I know that is a lot to take in. Does anyone have any questions at all? Because I know it's definitely a lot and we're gonna keep practicing as well. Bella, there was a, a question about uh, someone heard diet sodas are worse than full sugar sodas. Do you want to comment on that in regards to diabetes? Yes. So, um, yeah, that is right. You know, just diet sodas, they do use sugar substitutes and it's usually aspartame. And it, do, it is worse in regards to overall health in my, well, I shouldn't say my opinion, but in the chemical makeup of it as well, because it can affect your brain. And they also just add a lot of like artificial colors and more artificial artificial ingredients to keep the sugar level lower, lower. But it usually doesn't spike up your blood sugar as fast as a non-diet soda. I know for me in the hospital setting, when diabetic patients want a soda, we're not allowed to give them a normal soda. It does have to be diet. So if that answers your question, or you could definitely like rebuttal, or you could ask more questions on top of that, just let me know. So Thanks, yeah, is there anything else, Trisha, in the chat? No, that's it so far. All right, let's see. So we're gonna practice a little more. Okay, and this time we're gonna use a label so we could kind of visualize what it would look like looking at a package having to determine how many carb choices a serving of the food. So we're gonna look here. On this in here, we're gonna look at the carbs. So I know that could be kind of hard to read. It's kind of blurred a little weird. So there's 37 grams of carbs in this food. So how using the equation, how many carb choices does 37 grams um, of carbs equate to? 
So what we're going to do, we're going to plug that. Did I write it in that one? No. We're going to plug the 37 into the equation. So we are going to do, I don't know if you guys are doing it along. Perfect. So, so one person said 2.5. We're so fast at math. <laughs> I know, exactly. I know we just did it and we're like 2.466. But yes, 2.5 would be more appropriate, yes, to round up to. So that certain food, whatever that label's referring to, would be equal to two and a half carb servings. And then we're going to talk about like meal planning. So these are an example of a carb choice menu. So for breakfast, this person had a slice of whole grain toast, which was equal to one carb choice. And then they had some light margarine, a teaspoon, and then egg omelet with spinach and mushrooms, which is high in protein and healthy fat, but very low in carbs. That's why it's not really equal to a carb choice. An orange and a six ounce Greek yogurt. And I just would like to point out how in this meal, there's three carb choices. And then in here, you know, he has two choices from the sandwich, one from the fruit, and then one to two cups of veggies. Depending if he had one or two cups, it'd be zero to one choices. So in here, he has three to four carb choices that he ate. And then for dinner, he has a winter squash, so he has one, two, three. So for dinner, he had three as well. So what this person did and what we're really supposed to do, especially when monitoring diabetes, is kind of trying to keep it balanced. So keep your choices balanced throughout the day versus having or spending six of your choices at breakfast and then having two at dinner just because we don't want your blood sugar to spike and crash. They maintain throughout the day having about three or four at each meal to just make sure they're getting enough carbs and making sure it's probably spaced out equally in between to just keep your blood sugar more stable and just manage that from your glucose levels from spiking. All right, so we wrap that up. And I know that was a lot of information, so I'm very open to like any questions in regards to this or any personal experiences you guys might wanna share. And it was a lot of math too, so I'm definitely open to answering questions. I can't really see the chat either, so yeah, <laughs> just let me know too. All right, let's see if give everyone a minute to type in and yeah. mm -hmm. I'll let you know if I see anything here. Right, and if you guys want, sorry, was that somebody speaking? I could, I know, I could always go back to the map as well if you guys want to revisit, because I know it was tricky, but the um, the information we're going to send you after this class, that'll definitely help you. And I got a lot of information from that as well. It has the formula and it really prints it out very well and it makes it easy to follow through. No, so it's there's anything on the chat, so I think we're good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, before I wrap up and then hand it over to Haley, I just wanted to say, I know it could be confusing at first, but even for myself and being a student, it took me a while, you know, we had a pretty good unit on this as well to just kind of get the hang of the math and keeping it balanced as well. But as long as you have like maybe an RD or a good support system, it'll just make the process a lot easier. And it's really fun in a hospital setting, working there and kind of teaching the patients how to navigate and how to count their carbs and you know where to spend it and how to be balanced so i think that's also a big part of it as well because it could be kind of frustrating at first especially with the math but the more you practice and the more support and the more you ask questions too it could definitely be easier to pick up on yeah i'll start i'll stop blabbering i'll give it away to Haley. <laughs> uh, there's a question now yeah. yay okay um, yes so the question is what about mm -hmm. when you wake up is it better to load carbs or ease in? When you wake up to, to load carbs or yes. are they asking, so are you asking like when you wake up, is it better to like um eat first thing you wake up or wait to eat? If I understood that question correctly. correctly. I'm assuming to eat to load on carbs versus 
like ease in, like eat lower is what I'm trying yeah. to do. Yeah, and Trisha, you could always chime in on this, but I know from like what we were taught, it's just like best to kind of just keep it balanced throughout the day, like how many carb choices you consume between each of your meals and snacks to kind of just maintain those levels versus spiking first thing in the morning and then crashing later. But I mean, do you have any input on that as well? Um, I think what you mentioned about being consistent is the most mm -hmm. important. Um, however, like like you mentioned, some patients might need three to four carb choices per meal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had some yeah. people that might be more sensitive at certain meals. So by checking right. their blood sugar and kind of figuring that out, um, I mean, I've had patients who could maybe tolerate more like the four at breakfast, but maybe only three at dinner because they're less active right. in the evening. So I guess... I guess it would yeah, depend yeah. person to person whether they're doing like four 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 across the board versus maybe four four three. Yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. Just check or uh, check of those blood sugars would really help kind of solve that puzzle too. Mm -hmm. um, there was another mm -hmm. question here. Um, oh, there's a, is there an app to track carbs, um, Lawrence? I will post on the chat some apps out there for you. So there's some different ones um, yes. for diabetes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely post those. And then last session, um, we talked about how your liver accommodates when you're fasting for hours while you sleep. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you want to highlight on how you were talking about how the, the liver releases glucose? Yeah, um, that was in the last session you said? with you um, and Teresa. I think in your session, you, I think we were talking, remember you were talking about the Samoji effect and the dog oh, yeah. phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, like you said, like the, the liver does help filter that, especially at night. Um, but yeah, we were talking about the Samoji effect. I got it down this time and <laughs> the dog phenomenon. And it's just like waking up and then your glucose levels are like um, spiked or they're down because you were sleeping, because you were fasting that night as well. But yeah, we did touch about that on the first session and then I'll post um, all those slides I already did. And then the link is on to watch it as well. But yeah, but like what you said, Trisha, it just, it really does depend on the person, like their activity level. I mean, any wounds they may have, um, just their everyday life and like maybe any physical like ailments they may have or any sicknesses that may affect like how many carbs that they have, but kind of for like the sake of the presentation, like an overview teaching, try to keep it like the carb choices balanced throughout the day. Like you said, like a three, four, three snacks, you know, like a one, two, just to make sure that your glucose levels are more managed versus kind of sporadically <laughs> winging in it, as well as just checking your glucose levels too. That is a huge key, just being consistent with that. You know, just to kind of like get to know and learn your body more and also just keep yourself healthy and trying to manage diabetes as well. I know it's definitely a lot, but I think it'll help you become more consistent in like all your mannerisms and habits as well. And just kind of help guide you into this path of nutrition and health. But yeah. And is there any more questions before I hand it over to Haley? Um, yeah, there was one more. Maybe I could kind of help with this just based on my um, patient experience. Um, yeah. Someone just made a comment yeah. about um, their wife will get up at 2 a.m. to prevent um, having a sugar spike in the morning. And um, kind of like you mentioned, you know, sometimes people can get low in the middle of the night and then they can spike back up, um, rebound yeah. hyperglycemia. Yeah. And um, so a lot of times what it, it could be related to is the medication. Sometimes if the medication dose is too high in the evening, mm -hmm. like they're taking a mm -hmm. bedtime dose, if they are bottoming out in the middle of the night, that's something to talk to the doctor about because you shouldn't have to get up at 2 a.m. Um, mm -hmm. to make sure your sugars don't go too low and then get rebound hyperglycemia. Um, another thing is you can try having an evening snack um, with your medication too. And sometimes that can prevent you from bottoming out in the middle of the night. But it, it would definitely, you know, I, I hate having my patients having to wake up at two or three in the morning to check their sugars or eat food. Um, so just maybe trying to troubleshoot if it's the medication side with the doctor that's causing that or, you know, sometimes like having that evening snack can really help out. Right, right. definitely. 
and just know like you're not alone. It's definitely like a good group collaborative with your doctor, dietitians, and your diet techs and doing as much as you can on your part. But yeah, there's the experts out there to help you in managing that. You're not alone. And yes, you shouldn't have to get up at 2 a.m. to maintain that. So yeah. All right. Will that be it in regards to the fun topic of carbs and carb counting? Because I'm going to, I'll let you take it away from here. Yeah. A lot of very, very <laughs> I know. intense information. Um, so obviously the bulk of this is going to be about carbohydrates, but we also want to talk about um, the other macronutrients that we ingest. So we're going to start with protein. And proteins definitely have a lower effect on the blood sugar, but they're still very, very important for our normal bodily functions. So we want to make sure we're including protein with every meal. And we're looking at three ounces of lean or very lean protein. And if you remember from mm -hmm. Bella's discussion, that is about the palm of your hand size. And here are some examples of protein choices. So grilled chicken breast, I feel like is always a really great protein choice. Um, low fat, no added sugar Greek yogurt. Three ounces of very lean flank steak. We've got low mm -hmm. fat cottage cheese. Baked salmon, um, when it comes to fish, fish is great, but you want to stick to the lower fat fish. And those little tuna packets are really awesome for a quick boost of protein that you can add to like anything. When it comes to fats, you've all heard of good fats and bad fats, but we'd like to call them nutrient dense versus processed fats. So those nutrient dense fats are going to be the monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Examples of those would be almonds, avocados, olive oil, salmon, tofu, eggs, chia seeds, and walnuts. And the bad fats, the processed fats, those would be the saturated and trans fats. So for those, we're looking at very high fat meat and dairy, uh, skin on chicken, dark meat chicken, butter, um, any kind of processed food is most likely going to be high in those trans fats, baked goods, margarines, and sauces. Not all sauces, but check your labels. Let's talk about what fat does to the blood sugar. Fat in itself doesn't do very much to the blood sugar, but the more fat we eat, the more we can gain weight, and the more weight we gain, the harder it is for our bodies to use the insulin that we're making. So if we try to eliminate or avoid the saturated and trans fats, then we can kind of cut down on the risk of gaining weight. And that always leads to heart attacks and strokes. We'd like to try to limit those quote unquote bad fats to less than 10% of our total calories. And we would like to choose lean alternatives and heart healthy fats like those mono unsaturated fats. So some tips for eating fats when we're out is to maybe try to avoid the fast food or the fried foods. Um, even if you're getting fast food, you can try um, salads or grilled chicken instead of a fried piece of chicken or a burger. You definitely wanna be looking at the sauces, gravies and syrups that we add to the food because we don't even really think about the calories that we add to our meals when we put those on or what those calories are gonna be giving to us in terms of sugar or fat. So when we order something that usually comes with sauce, such as uh, wings or a salad, you can ask for that sauce on the side or just order them plain. Uh, use your condiments sparingly, because again, we don't often take into account how much we're using mm -hmm. and how much sugar could be in ketchup even. Um, when it comes to salad dressings, instead of those high fat, um, you know, creamy dressings, we can stick to olive oil and vinegar. We can toss on some nuts, some avocado. Those are always really good sources of the healthy fats. And for dairy, we want to choose the low fat dairy and cheese. Um, and also no sugar added is always a pretty good idea if we're dealing with diabetes. Uh, so Bella kind of touched on this with the with the carb monitoring, the counting of choices. Um, when we start and we go up really high and then we come back down, because we've tried to um, you know have six counts 
of carbohydrates with one meal. So we limit them at another meal. That's going to spike and drop the blood sugar. Um, so it's really key to not like save your carb choices, save your calories for other meals, but to keep it moderated, keep it balanced, and always try to eat consistently with what your doctor or your registered dietitian has recommended for the carb amounts. All right, so we're going to review these food groups again. These are our carbohydrate foods. So again, we're using the 15 grams of carbs for our carb counting. Fruit, we want to make sure um, we're talking about a small orange, not like the massive navel oranges that are in season right now. Small apples, peaches, and bananas. If you have a huge banana, you can always split that into two meals or just count it as two carbs. Um, juice is half a cup, um, and that's a pretty small amount of mm -hmm. juice. <laughs> So something to be aware of, uh, three quarters of a cup of berries, two tablespoons of raisins. Um, for starch, such as bread and grains, uh, 15 grams again is one slice of bread, a quarter of a bagel, a third of a cup of rice, half a cup of beans, six crackers, or three cups of popcorn. So if you're really hungry and you're looking for a dense snack, I think that three cups of popcorn is probably more mm -hmm. filling than like a quarter of a bagel. <laughs> so um, choosing wisely based on how you feel at that time is important. Um, starchy vegetables as opposed to non-starchy vegetables, um, potatoes, corn, peas, pretty much all of those um, higher carbohydrate vegetables, we're gonna have half a cup. Um, when it comes to the non-starchy vegetables, like peppers, carrots, cauliflower, tomato, zucchini, green beans, you can definitely have more of those because the equal size, half a cup, is only a third of a cob count. Um, for dairy, we're looking at a cup of milk, plus low fat, um, and two-thirds of a cup of yogurt. So... Uh, which of these foods are considered fats? All of them, but not that you would always think of ice cream as uh, something that would be high in fat. You'd probably think, well, it's mostly sugar, right? So yes, but these food items can be high in a lot of things. Um, and of course, here we have our healthy fats and our unhealthy fats as well. Um, dark meat would be uh, the unhealthy fats and white meat, chicken, or uh, lean fish would be a healthy fat. Our proteins, um, we're including all kinds of meat and dairy. So we're looking at lean beef, pork or lamb, white meat, chicken, um, fish, such as shrimp, crab, cod. Egg whites are awesome. Low-fat dairy, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, string cheese. Always great to have on hand for snack. Um, your protein bars and protein powders, you definitely want to check the labels on these because they can be full of hidden sugar. And nuts, legumes, and beans also contain a lot of protein. Um, definitely want to watch the carb counts with the beans and legumes, though. So we're going to look at a sample menu right here for lunch. This person is having two pieces of bread, half a sliced tomato, two ounces of roast turkey breast, a slice of low-fat cheese, a teaspoon each of mustard and light mayo, two pieces of lettuce, and they're also going to have a side of half a cup of fat-free uh, Greek yogurt, 10 almonds, and half a cup of baby carrots. And they're going to add in a glass of eight-ounce low-fat milk. So which of these foods are carbs? You guys chime in and tell me which ones the uh, carb choices would be. So the whole grain, um, the cheese, the Greek yogurt, almonds and carrots, and milk. Is that correct? Yeah. 
So how many uh, counts of carbohydrate would this look like? So five and a half, um, six, six, six and a half. Six, including the milk, yep. That sounds yep, about six. right. So this would be a pretty big meal. Um, Can I comment? Definitely. Sure. The cheese is not a carb. Mm -hmm. Oh, cheese is not. And then what was the other one? Almonds are a fat. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> is that <laughs> It's a lot to take. I know. I'm so confused by it, honestly. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Trisha. Uh-huh. All right. So making healthier choices outside the home. Um, kind of touched on this before, but asking for your meals um, with the sauces on the side or um, just plain. Um, when you're ordering meat, it's always good to order grilled or baked instead of fried. You can always split your meal into two, bag it up right then and there, or just save half of it on the plate. You want to make sure it's balanced, again, with carbohydrates, protein, and healthy fats with every meal. And plan ahead. If you know what restaurant you're going to go to, you can look up the menu online and kind of make a decision before you get there so you're not stumped looking at the menu not knowing what to order. So I would like a couple of people to chime in with some examples of goals that you can set to make healthier choices when you're eating outside of the home. For example, um, if I was hitting up a McDonald's drive through because I'm <laughs> running out of time or something, I would ask for a grilled chicken sandwich instead of a crispy chicken sandwich, and I would order that plain. What about you guys? Um, so I recently discovered the grilled chicken sandwich at Chick-fil-A. So, um, I would get the grilled chicken sandwich with bread, or you can, like you said, get the grilled chicken sandwich, cut it in half and save the rest for another meal. That's with an awesome idea. Yeah. Anyone else? I have something to share and it reminded me because of what Diana said about splitting the sandwich, but like working in a hospital setting, especially with car control patients, when they want like a different variety of food, but those foods may be high in carbs, we're able to like split those portions. So they're able to have a little bit of everything, but still stay in that carb allowance. So for example, say they wanted a grilled chicken sandwich, but they really wanted the bread, but they also want some fruit and they want, um, I'm trying to think of, or maybe like a starch, like mashed potatoes. So we don't want to limit those foods to them, but we do just have to know how to portion those sizes out. But then they're able to be filled and still get all the different types of foods and have a variety, but they're just being cautious, or we're being cautious and wary as a dietetic professionals of how much carbs we're giving them. And then them as the patient, depending on like the mental state, they're able to physically see those portions and they're able to read the ticket of us changing the portion sizes so that when they go home, they have a visual saying, oh, like, oh, that's what this many carbs looks like in this sandwich or what a fourth of a cup of mashed potatoes looks like. So like Diana and like what you mentioned, Haley, just like being wary of your portion sizes and whether that's having something so that you could keep your glucose level stable or maybe increasing something if you're not eating enough. I mean, portion sizes are really important and can really help, especially with making that change in transition and bettering your health and managing your diabetes. But yeah, that's that's my experience from working in the hospital in regards to diabetes and portion sizes. Do any of you guys have like any other input in regards to that or just healthy changes in general? Keep going ahead unless anybody Sorry. Has some, some menus do offer like fruit instead or like a side salad. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that, um, you know, like instead of having like, you know, potato fries or waffle fries, you can um, opt for, you know, like a fruit cup um, yeah. or like a side salad. So I would probably do that. Yeah, I think that's always a great idea when they add on um, like seasoned vegetables. Um, 
instead of french fries and things like that it's really awesome yeah and kind of like we mentioned even though like a certain amount of cookies and like a half a cup of fruit might equal to the same amount of carbs. It's like the density of where those carbs and nutrients are coming from. So like the fruit has lots of vitamins and minerals. It's just managing that amount, but yeah. And it's more filling and has more fiber as well. So it'll um, help you, but yeah, just having options to choose from is a big part of this journey and managing diabetes as well. So thank you, Diana. Anybody yeah. else? Does anyone have any questions about what we've discussed so far? It's kind of a lot. I know. So kind of, we're here to elaborate and help answer those. Does anyone have any questions about like carb counting or would like to like revisit that or how that works or even like the formula within itself? You could like speak up or you could go in the chat and then Trisha will just read it from there. Um, you know what, I can, I can stop sharing and then, yeah, then we can view the chat. Oh, and then references here, exit. Let's go. We're going to stop sharing. We're going to go in the chat with you guys so we can see. Let's take a look. And Bella, did you want to mention some of the references? You oh, mentioned? yeah. Like additional info on carbohydrate counting? Yes. Okay. I'm going to share the screen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share it again because I did have a reference page because we're not about to plagiarize. All right. Share. All right. So my references that I use. So Eat Right Pro, which is um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, has a lot of great information about diabetes and carbohydrates and macronutrients. We also have my plate, which is where they got that image of that plate and like how much um, different macronutrients should be on your plate. We have diabetes.org, so American Diabetic Association. And then Lily Diabetes, which is from the ADA as well. It's so Lily Diabetes is a great resource. It talks about carb counting, the carb exchange, and that's actually the resource we're going to send to you. That's where that that's the website it comes from. So for example, I screenshotted some of the charts as well. So I'll show you. So like the, this is from Lily's Diabetes. And as well as this is like a mini, so that's like the little exchange of how many um, grams of carbs that like a serving of starch is equal to. So we're gonna send that over to you guys so that you have that for yourself to view. And yeah, so we have that. But I was curious, do any of you guys have any? Yeah? Uh oh, I think I stopped it. I was gonna say I, I wasn't able to send it um because it's in a Google Drive and I wasn't sure if everyone had access to that, but Tatum's gonna um mm -hmm. post that education material on our integrative health website yeah. where the recording will be as well. Okay, awesome. And, and she did post it in the chat up here. Um the recordings will be found at www.paradisevalley.edu backslash journey to wellness. Okay. Perfect. Yes. And then I'll convert the Google slides into a PDF so that we can upload it onto the Canvas page as well for this. But I was just curious, do any of you guys have any experience with carb counting, whether that be through a nutrition program or because you had to do it for yourself or if you saw a loved one do it? I'm really curious to hear any stories and like personal experiences with that. I know Trisha had to put you on the spot, but you're a diabetes educator. Do they, are there like certain, oh, none new to me. Oh, cool. I know um, you have experiences with patients as well. And are there like any common frustrations or like maybe reoccurring patterns with like the newness of like carb counting? Um, sometimes like you were talking about myths about not eating carbs. Um, I've had patients be told by providers that once they were diagnosed, they could no longer ever eat corn, potatoes, peas, or bread again. Um, and 
like you said, they're completely not true. Like you both mentioned, we, we need carbohydrates for our body and it's all about moderation um, and consistency. So kind of reteaching patients about that. And it was such a relief for them. Um, I had a patient that was diagnosed at 65 and she saw me when she was 80. And all those years, she had been avoiding all those foods because that's what she was told. She could never eat them again. And when she came to see me, she's like, what? You mean I can eat that? I said, of course you can. It's, I mean, she learned carb counting and actually going from not eating them to all of a sudden eating them in moderation, her, her blood sugars actually got better. So, I mean, it, it, it goes to show a lot um, plant-based diets. Some people on plant-based diets think, oh, well, you eat so many carbs on plant-based, that's just going to make your blood sugars go up. It's actually false blood sugars are improved on a mm -hmm. plant-based diet because mm -hmm. you get so much fiber that it doesn't cause the spiking. Um, and some people have, this is through, a, I went to the American Diabetes Association conference and a physician presented on um, several case studies of plant-based diets that she put her patients on. And some of them even reverse their diabetes and put it in remission. Mm -hmm. So, um, so definitely you can eat carbs. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, like you reiterate, like we've been reiterating, like we need carbs for mm -hmm. energy. Teresa, who's in here, but she also helps present in this series as well. She's a big advocate for plant-based diets. Like you said, the fiber kind of helps to not have our glucose levels spike as much. And I mean, depending on what kind of plant-based diet you pursue, a lot of those vegetables or carbs you eat are very like leafy or lean. So they're, they're not really equated to as high in carbohydrates as like a piece of fruit. Yeah, definitely. It's about like portion sizes and balance and just like being aware but yes you have your potatoes you have your peas we're not going to take that away from you it's just learning how to navigate that does does anyone have any questions about what Haley presented on she did a really good job in like summarizing like fats and proteins and carbs and why we need them I think that our chat has been um lagging a little bit because we did see some Yes. So this is come in. Um, so someone said that they order the burgers with more bun, and that's a great idea to lower the carb count. Um, yes, protein style. A lot of places do protein style these days. In and out. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Trisha has the answer mm -hmm. to that. So someone so. asked, would taking a supplement for fiber help out? In terms of blood sugar. Yeah, in terms of blood sugar. Let's see. I mean, because like we talked about, like with fruit, for example, it won't spike your blood sugar as high because there's fiber in it. So I would assume so, but I'm pretty sure that you probably have more knowledge on that as well. Have you seen that with your patients who are taking a fiber supplement um, that helped? Or can I know consuming it could fiber? Help get total. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. could get extra total amount, but I think kind of my what you were saying more is focusing on more of the food fiber sources is going to help yeah. the blood sugar out more yeah. dramatically because you you have to take so much of that fiber supplement at each meal to really get that increase set. Um, I think yeah, doing 100% whole wheat bread or you know brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, um, those types of grains or lots more vegetables, um, things with more, you know, skins and seeds and all that are gonna have more. Um, so for example, like you mentioned an apple, an apple's gonna have more fiber than say, you know, melon, you know, so mm -hmm. people have different, you know, effects and that higher fiber content will tend to have less spiking of the blood. So I, I think it's best to do it with diet um, if you can. And some people do use the fiber supplements for other reasons, like more for bowel health, you know, for going to the bathroom. And that would be fine. Um, it probably won't as dramatically help your blood sugars, but it can help your, you know, get more soluble fiber for like, you know, regular bowel movement. So yes. Yeah. We love soluble fiber. <laughs> helps with your blood um glucose levels, helps you keep full for one. So you get and it has a lot of nutrients as well. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, let's see. Thank you, Gina, for asking that. Like I said, our chat is lagging for some reason. Do you guys see any other new comments after Gina's? Trisha, let's see. Oh. Um, not yet. All right. I know. Yeah, we're just going to keep an open discussion. Or if you guys want to ask about like our experiences, 
I am not diabetic myself, but we're going on our health. So we deal with a lot of like carb restrictions and I guess restriction is the most promoting <laughs> word, but um, carb Moderation. control. Yes. <laughs> The medical, or at least honor health, we call it card control, but yeah, there's definitely ways to go about it. Yeah, we try to stop using that word diet, you know, like in the hospital, we used to call it a diabetic diet. We try not to call anything a diet anymore because it's like you said, it's restrictive. So we don't want anyone to feel like they're being so restricted. Like you said, you can still eat a cookie. That's totally yes. fine. You can just work it in to you know balance and moderation and uh, work it into your carb count plan so it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't ever eat those things you can right right i know it's interesting yeah. working in the hospital they don't call it a diabetic diet like when when they talk to the patient or when we're ordering them food like even on their menu it's called like a carb control menu versus so i think it's just the wording too I think it helps them to realize um, why they have diabetes, which is in terms of carbs, and then what we need to do to help them, not restrict them, but just help keep it under control. So I feel like wording's definitely helped a lot too with patients and understanding what diabetes is and exactly how it works. I think that's where a lot of the myths come from as well, like mm -hmm. not eating carbohydrates or not eating corn and pizza. Yeah. I think... You know, maybe in prior years, it was easier to just tell a patient, don't eat this, yeah. than to explain how to... Right. Yeah. Exactly. We're not carb restricting. <laughs> We're like restricting. We're just keeping it balanced and keeping it under control as well. And like we mentioned last session, um, you know, if you have insurance, you can always check with mm -hmm. your insurance to, you know, find a, a dietitian or diabetes educator that's contracted with your plan. If, if you do want one-on-one -on -one help with managing your blood sugars or, you know, trying to solve those patterns like we talked about or why you might be having highs and just can't figure it out. Um, like you mentioned, it's, you don't have to do this alone. Um, that's why you, you do have support from your medical team to help you along with that. And, um, and, and that, yeah, depending on your insurance, you'll, you'll have a dietitian, um, several probably contracted with your plan. So you can find one that's contracted and not have to pay anything and go see them. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Yes, mm -hmm. diet plays a big, huge role in it, but also just seeking help from, you know, a registered dietitian, um, a DTR, depending on how much that they can practice within that or you know, your medical doctor. So it's just, it's a team effort. And you're, if you keep doing that, you're not going to be alone and you have a good support system. It's just finding the best resources and just having those people there to help you, whether that be medically or even just mentally as well. It's definitely a journey, but we're all in this together and we'll help you out in however way. So Bella, it looks like there's no more on the chat. So, okay. um, just wanted to thank you both um, for presenting today and providing all that great information. And then next week we will be on our fourth session and we'll be going over um, overviewing medication for diabetes as well as complications um, next Thursday at one o'clock. Yay. Yeah, thank, you guys. thank you for the support, everybody. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys facilitating these sessions as well and the support. Thank you all for joining in. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you next Bye. week. All right. It looks like there's nothing else. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Hi, Diana.